two awesome musicians get it done. Yes. Way to go, crew. Way to go, team. Worship-filled hearts that come to serve the king. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Luke 2, we're going to finish up our three-part series in Luke chapter number 2. We're going to look at a part of it that uh, I'm sure that you've done a devotion or two, maybe a little study at times. Uh, there's a lot, of course, in Luke 2 that uh, when it just comes simply to the Christmas story and a lot of people read it this time of year and, and uh, of course, in your regular Bible reading. And, but you might glance past some things. It fits for us, again, as we looked at three weeks ago or three Sundays ago, two weeks ago, that we would have a, a short little series of uh, preaching and teaching the Word of God and shorter messages with our music and uh, the different things that have gone on. And, and it's been really, really good to be able to have um, the last two Sundays, now our third, and uh, thinking about His Majesty this after, I mean, uh, right after a service, right after uh, we're done with service, we'll be having the Lord's Supper. It's the fourth Sunday of the month and, and uh, to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ, to celebrate His Majesty but we started out two Sundays ago thinking about, talking about, walking through what it means to witness his majesty. There were five different characters that, well, one of them for sure is in the Bible, that's old Joseph. But, of course, we had uh, um, Mary's mother came up here. And, and, of course, we had the innkeeper's son. And, and they were looking at things and the... The little dramatic parts, four or five minutes each, were played out with the idea that, and it was, it was biblically based, that each one of them was saying, look, we witnessed the Lord Jesus Christ. We witnessed his majesty in somehow, some way, that message came across. I've never really uh, seen it that way where, I wonder all those people around that time that God did not put in his word what they saw, how they handled it, what they were thinking. As a famous friend has once said, this is a picture book, isn't it, John? And there's a lot of pictures in here. There's a lot of pictures in the Word of God. And you see, wow, those shepherds lined up and it sets all up. The angels come, the angels speak, and then they go away. Angel Gabriel, the, the, the incredible type of setting this is. And so many people witness so many things. And, of course, God chose to put what he put in the word, and that's, that's it. That's done. That's, that's the complete word of God as we see it. But as we walked away from that, we had a short little message. We talked about what it means to witness some things, to, to see them, to actually say, hey, I experienced something. I saw that thing. To see something by personal experience, to attest that I saw it. To not hear from someone else that they saw it, because then that would be your testimony, witness of what you saw to them, but to, for them to say, hey, you had an eyewitness of something? Yeah. So then it brought a question at the end of that message, which said, if we never experience the majesty of Jesus Christ, how could there ever really be any witness? Well, I'll just repeat what somebody else told me. Yeah, I guess that would be all right. But when you and I experience the majesty of Jesus Christ in our lives in a, in a church gathering setting, in a disciple-making relationship, in a small group, in some type of setting where you're, you're, you're walking from door to door talking to people about Jesus Christ, you're, you're hosting something on your property, you're hosting something at your house, you're doing something in the community, you're reaching out to people, we do ADP sports, you do some type of mission or work, and you go, wow, I just saw God show up, the majesty of Jesus Christ, whoa, what? powerful, powerful witness I just had of his goodness and greatness. And then we looked at wonder his majesty last Sunday. Wonder his majesty. Wonder. Okay. What does it mean to wonder? Not wander. Wonder. What does it mean to actually wonder? Faith and wonder. Really, there is power in the name of Jesus, that faith and wonder. We, of course, sung that really neat song that goes along with our series Majesty, worship is majesty today. I love that little song. It's a simple little, like a chorus or a, a mini little hymn. But it comes into this place then of other songs that are written, which come back to, again, what the Word of God has said. 
And we went into the Word of God last week about wonder, amazement, astonishment, marvel. What does it mean to wonder? It's that emotion which is excited by something presented to your sight or your mind. And you are astonished. You admire it. You go, wow, that was a pleasant or extraordinary surprise. Wow. Is that the way you see God and some of the things that he, do, that he does? Do we really see it? So it moved from witness becomes wonder. And I asked you a question at the end of our message last week. What will our faith and wonder be like this season after our wonder of his majesty today? This season is the Christmas season time of our American culture, the word culture. It's a season that you are living in. By the way, there is no winter season this year. Just, you know, just want to make sure that's on record here. I mean, I'm thinking it's all right. A lot of people want to see snow. I, I know I mention it every once in a while. No, nope. it's okay if it just passes us by. It's okay. I know, though, for Dwayne and other sinus and allergy sufferers, you'd like it to get really cold. So it can get cold, but it doesn't have to snow. Deal? Deal. We did have December 21st the other day. A little solstice time, shortest day. Now we're headed on to the upside. Here we go. And it's 70-something degrees on Christmas Eve. Not a bad deal. Not a bad deal. The trees are confused. But when you wonder about something, you wonder, one of the places you can simply wonder is his creation. You wonder of how he made everything the way he made it. We just had our Genesis course finish up, Genesis 1. We went through chapters 1 through 11, got a bonus intro to 12. We're now going to have in our next semester in Bible Institute, Genesis 2 from chapters 12 through 50. And you think of all the wonder of creation, all the wonder of the early times. You think, wonder his majesty. Wow. Majesty, kingdom, authority. We, we are really in a place where we go, God. What is it about you that I should wonder? Well, guess what? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if I really do wonder of the things of God. Because somehow the, quote, Christmas season time goes. We say, the best time to witness. And, and here we go with just having a great time of seeing how people might be open to the gospel. Look, look just, just, let's, just, let's just be straight here. People are open to the gospel anytime. You know how you find out? <laughs> Go talk to them. Have a witness with them. So today, very simply, another W word to pull us all together. I want to have us move from witness to wonder to worship. Worship, worship his majesty. To worship, of course, is to honor or show reverence for a divine being, supernatural power to regard with great or extravagant respect and honor. True worship is a valuing or a treasuring of God above all things. As Jesus stated in John chapter number 4, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is the spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. As the body of Christ, his bride, we gather on this last Sunday of the year to worship together. Thank you for being here and worshiping together. Thank you for saying, okay, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go to church, and we're going to worship together. We're moving from a place from witness to wonder to worship, and I want to see where we're going to go. Thank you for the singers that came up here and said, we're going to sing. Thank you for the people out in the lobby who are greeting people, and thank you for all the children's ministry workers and the youth ministry and all the people that have volunteered. We gave you one of the 52 Sundays off to take a break. And you stayed home. And I don't know if you're watching on TV now, but shame on you. No, I'm just joking. I'm glad you took a break. But here we are together, gathered in the last Sunday. And you go, gosh, what happened to the year? Same old thing. How does time fly? How does time go by? Sometimes it's good to see some things go. But sometimes you don't like when some things go away. Sometimes you think, oh, gosh, it's so, I'm so glad that such and such grew up and moved out of the house. I'm so glad for the later years in marriage where the kids moved out. 
And then there's the other mom and dad. I'm so sad. I don't want my kids never grew up. I don't want my kids to grow up. Somehow, some way, we have conflicting thoughts over when things end and new things begin. But it is a recognition today on December 26, 2021, that we've got five days more, six days into the, and we'll be into the new year. See, everyone has thoughts on what worship is to them. We're gathered on the last Sunday. We're worshiping together. What does it look like? But oftentimes, it's a matter of who. It's not the what is worship. We sing. We do some things together. We pray. But what is worship to people? Well, it's not just a Sunday thing, of course. Duh, what's the matter with you, Brian? Don't you know that it's more than that? Yeah, it is. And so people start identifying. Right now you're thinking, what's worship to you? What's worship to you? And you look up a definition and you see, maybe from the Strong's Concordance or the old dictionaries, that it is reverence. It is homage. It is adoration and veneration. It is obeisance to bow down to someone, to something, to give complete submission, to say, I will prostrate myself and lay flat down on the floor, face down. That is obeisance. Everyone has their thoughts on what worship is to them. But I wonder, again, if it's a matter of who. Not what. But who do you worship? Who do we worship? How long does worship last in your life? A few hours, a few days, a few minutes? Worship is good. Oh, gosh, I hear so many messages on, on worship. I know. I think maybe when we looked this morning at just a couple of characters, we realized that there's some certain characteristics of people that really worship that God records in the Bible, and it's nothing more than what I just read you as a definition. Complete submission and obeisance, adoration and veneration to his majesty. Do you worship his majesty in your thoughts, your actions, your words, your life, your, your, your heart and what's going on inside? Do you follow some of the Psalms that it says in Psalm 99, exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool for he is Holy, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. What about in Psalm 95? Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Okay, I'm done with worship. Let me go home. I need to make a meal. I need to get go. Well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with making a meal and getting ready for the afternoon. It's, do I have a heart of worship over it? Well, I need to take care of my house. I need to go to work. Great. Who am I worshiping in the midst of it all? Am I trading off the worship of God, his majesty, his glory, his good, his incredible, marvelous beauty? Am I trading that off? Each time that I allow something in my thoughts, and my words, my actions, or can my thoughts be worship-filled? Can my words be worship-filled of his majesty? Can my works and my actions? Yes, absolutely. It's majesty. It's his majesty. I like this word. I really love this word. Because it explains who he is in another way. But explaining God is a hard thing to do. <laughs> That's the best Bible Institute final ever given. Explain God. You have an hour. Good luck. It's from an unused word, this, uh, excuse me, unused root, this word grandeur. Found in the Holy Scriptures, majesty. Beauty, comeliness, excellency, glorious, glory, goodly, honor, and majesty. I've read these each week to have you ingrained in that place of what it really means. The old song, America the Beautiful, Purple Mountains, Majesties, Above the Fruited Plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. 
something majestic. When you look up at it physically, it's immense and it's so beautiful, it's overwhelming. So we look at things that are majestic and things that are filled with majesty. We look at maybe the Alps or we, we look at some big mountain or we look at some incredibly high, high building that was built. We go, wow, that's beautiful. The wonders of the world. We think, wow, that's majestic. That's majesty. That's wow. Um, Romans chapter number one, the reader is warned that we worship the create. excuse me, the creature more than the creator. We get stuck worshiping and finding majesticness. Oh, he's such a great athlete. Seriously? How many times do we need to hear that? It's like kids today saying they have like five best friends. How is it possible that you have five best friends? Well, she's my best friend, and he's my best friend, and she's my... I thought when you used the word best, that mean that was it. Like the word great or greatest. Well, I have a lot of great friends. Well, what's your greatest friend? Well, I got five greatest friends. See, God is majestic. God is above all. He is majesty. What is majestic in your life? What is it that holds the power of your attention? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it his majesty sitting down at the right hand of his majesty, as it says in Hebrews 1, who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the power of his, excuse me, the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Again, behooves rereading each week as we have for three straight weeks. Witness becomes wonder. Now wonder becomes worship. His majesty. Majesty. The word simply means greatness. Divinity of God. Divinity of God himself. O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set the glory above the heavens. His glory is greater than thy salvation. Honor and majesty hast thou laid upon him. You ought to study and read and go on and on on that. You can really, like any Bible study, anytime you're studying some words, some principles, some doctrines, some stories, some characters, characteristics of people in the word of God, you go, wow, there's a lot here. Well, that's nice. It's a little more than nice. Maybe you need to ask yourself this question today about God. How do I identify? How do I identify with God? I ask myself again. How do I identify with God? How do you? Because when you and I are described by someone, they're going to see, excuse me, give a witness of what they've seen. They say, hello. Somebody might come into the building, sit down. They might hear some music and sing a little bit. They might look around, the Lord's Supper uh, things or whatever they think. They see some Christmas trees. They see a big screen. They look around. They see some things. And they say, okay, this, this church, I don't know. I don't see any place where they identify with God. Well, then I got to look at the banners. Well, that sounds pretty good, I guess. Well, the Lord's Supper, I guess that. Christmas tree. But then they open up the Bible. And then you meet the people. And you say, ah, they like to talk about God. Do we? Do we identify with God well? Because therein lies the question that behooves what we worship. Who we worship. As I said earlier, many people have, most everybody I would think have thoughts about what worship is, but I'm afraid that it really is about who worship is about. So I've heard enough of messages about worship. Yes, again, I've said it. There's nothing wrong with hearing it again. Because we're going to hear, just for the next few minutes, about two people. The worship of one man and the worship of one woman. Two simple people. Older in age, as it has been estimated. One, we get a good idea from Anna. We, we see that 
She's got to be close to 100 just by the years that are described. Simeon has said that he's over 100 at this time. I'm thinking two people that have just waited and waited and waited and waited and waited some more on his majesty because they want to worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raise. So, exalt, lift up the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Our words can be used for worship. Oh Lord, my God. I need to use my tongue and my mouth to extol you and exalt you more. I need to replace some of the things that my mouth worships with the things of you, like the characters today in Luke chapter number 2. I'd like you to join me in verse number 21. I'm going to read through it down to verse 38, make a few comments, bring up Simeon. And make a couple of applications, a couple, two or three from him and two or three from Anna, and we'll be done. Follow along with me in our passage for study today. Luke chapter number 2, verse number 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Keep in mind, this is the last accounting, though. This is the seventh accounting of anyone that had their name accounted for ahead of time. But Jewish custom is that you come and have your child circumcised after the eighth day, and then you present them here. In a moment, they'll present them before God. After the circumcision, they'll be named. And then what comes next? The purification of mom. Verse number 22. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So again, the purification of Mary comes. It's 40 days Jewish custom after a, a man-child is born. It is 80 after a woman-child is born. So the purification of Mary has to go on. They are following everything in the Jewish custom according to the word. That's what they're doing. Of course, Jesus then gets introduced to the author of the law besides he himself, which is Moses, as it is written again, according to the law, Moses was accomplished. They brought him to Jerusalem. This is Jesus, to present him to the Lord. So they're fulfilling everything. Circumcision, naming the child, purification of Mary, presentation of the baby to God, and then, of course, they have to offer sacrifice. Verse number 23, as it is written in the law, the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And verse number 24, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. We know enough in the accounting of Mary and Joseph to know that they don't have very much. The normal sacrifice is the lamb. Here in this text, it is obvious that they do not. It doesn't mean that it was an incorrect sacrifice. It is what they had. You see, Joseph and Mary were doing all that God required from his word when it came to purification of Mary, circumcision, naming of the child, presenting him, giving sacrifice. It's powerful. They are doing all that they can according to the word of the Lord. They are Jewish. They know. That circumcision fulfills the law and the covenant of Abraham. Everything is covered right here. Up until this point from verses 21 through 24, we've got everything again in a place where it's very Jewish. But here we go. Simeon, yes. Anna, yes. We're about to hear that they are prophesying of some things, and Anna is even called a prophetess. Here's two people that are prophesying what's coming off of this one named Jesus. But also, you see Simeon saying that this is the one that's fulfilling the prophecy of the Old Testament that he is knowing, he knows of from Isaiah. We continue in verse number 25 down through 38. 
And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Very simply put, Simeon, like all the other Jews that knew of the messianic promise, were waiting for the messianic promise to come in. They're waiting on the Messiah. If they know the Bible, they know a little bit of the Old Testament, they know that this is clearly the statement that needs to be met, excuse me, statement that needs to be fulfilled from the Old Testament, it's the consolation of Israel. They have hope. Please, Jesus, come. Messiah, come. But when he came, they rejected him. The interesting part in verse number 25, after that, I stopped because I want to make emphasis from this point through 27. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. This is Simeon. Verse 26, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Verse 27, and he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, before I go any further, think of this. Simeon has a relationship with God so deep and we'll bring it back in a moment, that it's mentioned he was led by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost was upon him. They had such a great relationship that he was filled and moved by the Lord God himself. It mentions in verse 26 that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. No backpedaling. No, I don't know what I believe and what I wonder. This is a man over 100 years old, clearly, exactly how, how old I do not know, but in the accountings of different people, he is over 100 years old, waiting on God's promise, the consolation of Israel. Powerful. Powerful worship right here. Are you waiting on the second coming of Jesus Christ? That's the crowning consolation of Israel crowning for all the believers to go home to glory as whatever you see or not see fit there is a statement of how Jesus came once he's to come again and here you and I are going okay what's this guy doing he's waiting on the first coming the coming of Jesus Christ it continues 28 I reread then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, we'll come back to that in a moment, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people. Woo! Verse 33, here's this wonder. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Remember, Mary's pondered things in her heart. Simeon blessed them, verse 34, and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for fall and rising against, again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of thy many hearts may be revealed. Here's a simple little three-point message for later on down the road. If you want to look it up, very simply, the stumbling is Jesus Christ. He's the chief cornerstone, but he was the stumbling stone. They stumbled over him, the stone. The sign, the sign really is the truth. All the miracles and things, it's the words of truth because he is that sign the truth that came in jesus christ i am the way the truth and the life he says also yea sword shall pierce through thy own soul also verse 35 that's a prophecy to mary to let her know as the mother of jesus christ she's going to take some heat okay so consider that as jesus's earthly ministry unfolded for those 42 months of him walking on this earth, his mother was around. So when you see this stuff, you go, wow, this guy, Simeon, was tied together with God that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And then verse 36 through 38, we have Anna. 
Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, which is Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a hundred, excuse me, a husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow about four score and four years. He must have been a great husband, boy. She stayed a widow for 84 years. No, she did according to the word. It says she was a widow for 84 years. Married for seven. Do your math. She's got to be over 100. What a faithful woman here. It says that she was a widow of four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that look for redemption in Jerusalem. Anna, just a couple, two or three verses there. Simeon, a few more. What two beautiful examples. Again, go study them a little bit on your own this week. There's even more here, but my hope is that I've given you a little historical overview, a little doctrinal overview. Now, here's something practical for you for a few minutes, and I'll be done. Simeon. Simeon himself saw in his life wonder, move, and become worship. Simeon was a just and devout man whose relationship with God defined him as a worshiper. Back to verse 25. Just, devout, waiting for the consolation, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. That was said of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter number 4, correct? We know that the Holy Ghost hasn't come to take the place of Jesus, and the, another comforter promised by Jesus in John's Gospel. 14, 15 a little, 16. So the Holy Ghost hasn't come like the day of Pentecost come, but the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost is in operation. The Holy Spirit's at work here with a person that's really close to him. He is defined as a worshiper because of his relationship with God. Back to the identity thing now. How do you identify with God? Well, I'm a pretty good worker. Uh, got a nice house. A nice family. A pretty good Christian. I, I go to church. I Wait a minute. Time out here. Time out. Is that how we're going to identify with God, everybody? We need not. Some of you have chosen in your lives not to identify with God that way. Thank you. You've raised it up and said, the bar is Jesus Christ. He is who we identify with in the flesh because he's son of God, son of man. He's king, yes. He's God, yes. But of course, he's servant and man. In those gospels, you and I just completely can be just overwhelmed and, and an overflowing sense of, wow, this is the life of Jesus Christ to identify with him. And he's a worshiper of his own father. He worships his father. Jesus is a worshiper who deserves to worship because he's his majesty. He's my example. I can look in the mirror and say that Mark Brown in the flesh is my example. I don't like that example. I like the Holy Spirit example through the word of God, to make me more like Jesus. That Simeon, he was a true worshiper. He's defined as one. You know, wonder becomes worship in another way. Simeon was a worshiper of God, led by the Holy Spirit, to be in the presence of the, his majesty. What do you mean? Well, it works hand in hand. Verse 26. It was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he has seen the Lord's Christ. He came by the Spirit into the temple. Okay, so the Holy Spirit leads him to the temple. Why is he at the temple today? Because he doesn't have any idea. He doesn't know. Does he know that God's going to ordain this day where he is going to see the Lord's Christ? Well, i just like to know how it's going to be in 2022 for my whole walk with the Lord. I mean, if I do such and such, and I do such and such, and I do such and such, and I do such and such, then he should do such and such, and he should do such. Really? That's not worship. That's not even faith-based. 
That's results-based, merit-based, take the grace out of it-based. I'll just do a sense of rules and a sense of things, and that'll be my worship. We've all tried that. Maybe too much for some of us. Well, then I'll use the cerebral approach. I'll use the hard-working approach. I'll use the ministry approach. One of these approaches has got to be better to be a worshiper. Simeon was a worshiper of God led by the Holy Spirit to be in the presence of his majesty. You know how, you, how that happens? You get in his word. You get in with him. You spend time with him a lot. And you get closer and you get closer and you get closer and you get closer. And over the course of a week and a month and a year and two years. And you wake up after four, five, six, seven, ten, fifteen, twenty years. And you go, oh my goodness. Whew. The Holy Spirit is the one speaking to me through the word of God. And I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to be led by him. And not walk around with your expertise in yourself saying, I know this is what God wants me to do, even though every single thing is contrary to God's word. It has to line up with God. Simeon lined up with God. Thirdly, in the wonder becomes worship, Simeon was in the presence of his majesty to hold and bless God. The living word. There's not much to say here. Just to stop and be overwhelmed. Just take a deep breath here. He's the first to hold. Besides mom and dad, he's holding the word, the living word. Not your Bible on your lap. The living, the John chapter number one, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's holding him. After the circumcision and the purification, how old is Jesus? Two months? He's holding the God of the universe, and he's blessing him. Don't those things kind of mess you up? And you sit, and I sit and demand things from God? He allowed that. He... We, we're just so trite in what we think God is and how we, we should in, 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 interact with him. He's the God of glory. He is majesty, and the majesty of God is being held by Simeon, and he's holding him, and he's blessing the living word. Simeon held Jesus. I haven't been able to get over that. For years and years and years and years, from the very first message that I ever heard preached out of it, of course, reading it so many times, I just can't. It boggles me. But that's God. And then he says, of course, depart. <laughs> I just want to get out now. <laughs> Release me from this prison of this flesh that I'm in because i got to get out of here. <laughs> so the last piece about Simeon is this. In his wonder that became worship, Simeon was filled with the word of God as a prophet which caused Joseph and Mary wonder. I mentioned it in passing to consider this. Whew. He knows the Old Testament. He knows a little bit about this prophet Isaiah. He's being a prophet now. And, and, and think real quick. Think in there. The, the, the verses are 33 through 35. But you really see what he's got here? Verse number 32. I like to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people. We haven't heard yet about how Jesus is going to go to the Gentiles and that his salvation, messianic hope, consolation Israel, is also going to the Gentile. If you go back and look in your Bible, you'll see very simply that's a reference to Isaiah. And when we see that, we go, wow. You see, verse 31, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, the glory of thy people. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon then blessed them. Behold, his child set for the fall and rising again, as I mentioned, of many in Israel. And I mentioned those three things, the stone, the sign. And you go, wow. This prophet, Simeon, is speaking prophecy, and even Joseph 
and Mary, just like you and me would wonder. We would be marveling. We would be pondering, going, wow, look at this. That the thoughts, verse 35, of many hearts may be revealed. The receivers of the Redeemer are the rejectors of the sacrifice. The beautiful sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So, here's Anna for two minutes here. We won't underscore her. Maybe we'll go three or four. Here we go. Now, Anna, from verses 36 through 38, just three simple verses, the worship of a man. Now, here's the worship of a woman. Here's the worship of two people, two God people. Anna's called a prophetess, yes. There are many prophetesses that are mentioned in the Scriptures. Even Elizabeth and Mary were prophesying because they were passing on what the angel told them. But of course, Anna was a prophetess. So was in Deborah in the book of Judges. Haldu in 2 Kings. Noadiah in Nehemiah, the wife of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 8. It is said that, of course, Philip had four daughters. They were. So when you look at the Word of God, you're going, okay, this Anna... Her name means grace. She's a godly woman. She was very old, yet just like Simeon, she just waited on the promise. That's worship, getting close to God, not waiting with an attitude or a chip on your shoulder or a nasty temperament or a criticism about what God hasn't done yet, but rather on the other side going, wow, I can't wait no matter what it is, no matter what it takes. It's okay. God, I'll wait and I'll wait and I'll wait to the promise of your second coming of your son, Jesus Christ. It's okay. I'll wait and I'll wait and I'll wait and I'll wait. Well, they were waiting on the first coming to see the Lord's Christ. Think about Anna. Think about her real quick. You see, her wonder became worship. And wonder for us becomes worship when Anna, as a servant of God with longevity over many years, as a faithful worshiper. It says in verse number 36, had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, but kept on going and lived and lived and lived, it says there, four score and four years, and she departed not from the temple. Simple. Simple statement. Wonder becomes worship, and it stays that way if you and I are going to say, that's enough, that's enough, that's enough, I'm going to come worship, that's enough, I need to worship some more, that's enough. Or you have, again, some type of measuring stick as to what has to come in order for you to continue your worship. It doesn't say that anything she did was predicated on result. She just remained faithful for all her years. She was a faithful worshiper, it says, and departed not from the temple. Whew. That's longevity, everybody. That's serious. That is a little bit contradictory to some of us in America who get bored after five minutes of quiet time with the Lord, 10 minutes, maybe 15 or 20. I can't get off my phone. I need to get my phone. Well, I'm telling you, I understand electronic devices, devices have nice little um, things on them, little apps and Bible stuff and things like that. Why don't you use it for a study thing and why don't you maybe just grab, out, grab a Bible, lay it out, and then have the phone as a study guide or something or to look things up, but use that. It might cause you just to sit there for a moment and to study Maybe we need to do some things that would be contrary to the culture that is causing you to not be a person of longevity in your worship. We need to shorten the services up to 65 minutes and then down to 60 and then down to 50 and then down to 40. I brought Brownie just, you need you speak and you get 10 minutes and you better be done. Sometimes we're crazy. What about our personal worship? This woman did it. She was a widow for 84 years. The second thing about her and her wonder becomes worship is Anna was a worshiper that filled her life. This is what works, see? Filled her life with fasting and prayers in the presence of his majesty. She hung out at the temple. She did praising too. I'll say that in a minute. 
praying and fasting, but I love the praising part because you see how it, it says in verse number 38, when Simeon came in with a baby and they were, she joined in to say thank you. And you can imagine what that praise service went like. You see, that worship for us is great. I know that there's a lot of deep conversations going out in the lobby. I've got secret little recording devices out there. And I tell you, I listen to some of that stuff out there. Oh, dear Jesus, what's going on out there? I don't know. <laughs> but here's the point. It's good. The fellowship's beautiful. But you come in here and you start praising together. And you start singing together. And I know some of you can't sing a lick. I understand that. But join in because there's a lot of people like you who can't sing. If you stand next to Craig, he can sing. He's got a beautiful voice. It, it make you sound better. But here's Anna, who was a worshiper that filled her life with fasting and pray, prayers and praising. What a way to go. You say that just takes too much time. <laughs> what do you think God's looking for? He's looking for worshipers. He's always looking for those to worship him. And Simeon was one, and Anna was another. In verse number 38, we see lastly, her wonder became worship, and our wonder becomes worship to be like Anna was in the presence of his majesty with a thankful spirit that witnessed for the Redeemer. When you are a true worshiper, there is a witness of God that turns into a wonder of God, then turns into a worship of God. Very simply speaking, she's saying, what? That the instant that the babe came in with Simeon and the family, and they were there. They gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, in verse 38, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. She became a witness all the way back to the beginning. Witness something, had a wonderment about it, had worship in your life, right back. Let me tell somebody now the way witness can work in a verb. I will testify of what I witnessed when I was the receiver of something. I will witness in the wonder of holding the Lord's Christ. I will praise and give thanks for all the years of waiting because I've been worshiping and worshiping and praying and fasting. And here I am. You just got to stay with it for a long time. And it's worth it. I just promise you it's worth it. It's worth every single moment that you think it's not worth it to be in the presence of his majesty with a thankful spirit that witnessed for the Redeemer. She witnessed for the Redeemer Jesus. They, anyone, it says there, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. There was people looking for redemption in Jerusalem. Think of it. Jesus Christ leaves the earth 30 years later from this moment, give or take. <sighs> Acts 1 comes 30, 32, 33, 33 years after this moment. And the Holy Spirit comes the day of Pentecost, and what happens? It's like it happened in five minutes, and they were work, waiting for centuries for the Word of God, the light of the world, the living Word of God. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And he came. Church, this morning we go into our Lord's Supper here, and we think for a moment, very simply, how our witness becomes wonder, and our wonder becomes worship, and it is His majesty. Here's a simple statement for you, and then a question. The statement is straight up, right to you, right for you. If the way in which we identify with God is not worship, then there is reason to believe we worship another. It causes you and I to go, what's the way I identify with God? If it's not worship, 
then there's some other person, some other thing that has my attention for worship. As you look back on this year, what reproof comes this morning from His Majesty in regards to your worship? Your worship. Please bow with me for a word of prayer as we go into the Lord's Supper. Our Father, our beautiful, beautiful God, your majesty, you are our majesty, his majesty. Thank you for your beautiful word and the accounting of in Luke's gospel of Simeon and Anna. Thank you, thank you for how they saw Jesus and they definitely lifted him high and exalted him in a baby form. Wow. What a moment in time that is so long ago. And yet, today we can come to the same kind of worship relationship just as Simeon and Anna had with the Lord that day in recording in the temple this beautiful moment. May we, God, right now, in the name of Jesus, capture what it means to have our wonder become worship and then turn over to witnessing to everyone that comes about the redemption of Jesus Christ that's available for them as we partake in the Lord's Supper. Have your way in our hearts. This is a time of worship for your glory in Jesus' name.